So I came to the U.S. four years ago this week on Election Day 2020. <laughs> so, and before I came, I've told this story before, but I asked one of my teachers, Ajahn Siri Panyo, how I should approach returning. And he said, look, you can watch the news a little bit, but only if you determine not to let it give rise to even one unwholesome mind state. And he said, look, America is just one large perception. It's just one concept. It's a concept. And then I was at Nana Chat and was giving a foot rub to Longpur Sumedho. And he said, yes, Sankara's formations, they go up and they go down. And as monastics, we really remain apolitical. It's deeply important um, to have a refuge where every element of society feels welcome, where we're all just human again. And in the US, the one institution we've had that's occupied that place has been Dolly Parton. No one knows her politics, and it's the one place, you know, you can go and find uh, truckers and drag queens all standing together, the Dalai Mama, as she's called, and, and what a gift, you know, but that's, that's what the song is supposed to be. And to um, serve as a reminder that there is something more pure that we're all moving towards, that when you take refuge in the Buddha, the Dhamma, and the Sangha, you step into a broader storyline that is stretched over 2,500 years, that has outlasted the rise and fall of empires, and this quiet thread of people practicing to purify the heart and to bring goodness into the world in a quiet way you can look and widen your view to understand how the Buddha navigated the situation in his time where you had the two great kingdoms of the era, Magadha and Kosala, clashing. You had one of his chief disciples, King Bimbisara, murdered by his son. The commentaries say the Buddha's clan was massacred. Um, towards the end or at the end of his life, although that's not in the actual suttas. You had famine, you had false accusations, you had politics, and since then, no matter how bad, there's a conceit that so many have that this is the end times, or this is the beginning of times. You know, I don't, some people may be quite, uh, excited with where the world's going and others may be distraught. But either way, there's, it can be this tunnel vision to focus just on this moment and forget that just 70 years ago, there were monastics quietly trying to remain in robes as the Maoist revolution was underway in China. And through every um, era since and before, the quiet thread of people practicing for the sake of the ending of suffering. And the power of that unifying thread through history. There's a sutta called the Pansadovaka Sutta, Anguttara Nikaya 3.101, and it's the dirt washer, but it's about purifying gold. And in it, the Buddha says, Imagine a gold washer uh, or his apprentice. They would take the dirty gold and put it in a pan and wash out the coarse sand, gravel, and grit. Then they would wash the middling defilements, the uh, finer sand, and finally, they would cleanse that gold of the fine dust until just gold was left. And then 
placing that gold into a furnace, they would blow on it until it heated and blow off off the dross. And as long as that dross had not been blown off, that gold would be brittle, not workable. But eventually, after blowing off the dross, that gold would be workable, malleable, bright, and luminous. And whatever ornament that goldsmith wished to make, a necklace, earrings, or otherwise, he could make it. Even so, a bhikkhu of heightened mind, a practitioner of heightened mind devoted to awakening, takes note and cleanses their mind of the coarse defilements. This is the gravel and grit, misconduct of body, speech, and mind. He wipes them out of existence, dispels them. After the coarse defilements have been dispelled, that practitioner cleanses the mind of the middle defilements, thoughts of sensuality, thoughts of ill will, thoughts of harmfulness. Then once the coarse, or the middle defilements had been cleansed, that practitioner would wash and cleanse the mind of the fine, subtle defilements. Thought of one's homeland, thoughts of one's caste, family. The literal word is vana or color, color. You can think of red or blue, you can think of whatever color you want, but your color. <laughs> and thoughts of not wanting to be despised. One would cleanse the mind of the fine defilements, thoughts of one's homeland, thoughts of one's caste of color, and thoughts of not wanting to be despised. And after the mind had been cleansed of these, they would turn the mind to an object of concentration until it became bright and luminous but still kept in place by the forcible fabrication of restraint. And then eventually even this would be unnecessary and the mind would just be luminous and serene. And then whatever workable, malleable, and whatever that practitioner turned that mind to, they would be able to realize it. So the Buddha, just the depth of wisdom in that simile. And one thing that really strikes me about it, um, I've wanted to speak on this goldsmith simile for so long. You know, first that gold doesn't mix with other metals that when you've touched Dhamma, when you found refuge in people and the teachings, nothing can taint it. The world can be doing what the world does and you still have found something which is immutable, precious, luminous, and pure that remains. And also that once we have right view, the more difficult a situation becomes, the more it can serve as a crucible, as a forge to, to sculpt us into more caring, loving, patient beings. If things are good, if they're always good, if they're always going your way, if you never have a co- chance to confront anger or difficulty, then it's easy to weave your heart in with the world which is so fragile. And when things break, you know, so often we can think, okay, I understand, you know, there's dukkha, there's suffering, there's stress in the world. But somehow it gets into our peripheral vision, it becomes an accessory. And every now and again, the wake up call from the world to truly understand samsara is broken. It's really broken. It's not a little broken. It's really broken. And like Longpo Suchita says, we just expect so much from a human life. Human life is not that good. You get married, it's okay. You have kids, they disobey you. Uh, your parents, you know, mess you up in various ways. You've been great, mom. <laughs> uh, um, human life is 
you know, the sad valleys of earth. These are what we're given. And yet, if they're approached with right view, they become a tremendous blessing because they become a tool to purify the heart. But that's because we're no longer expecting them to provide us with happiness. Rather, they represent a duty in line with Dhamma, in line with the storyline of 2,500 years we're stepping into to give a gift to those around us of the pure and quiet and calm and loving heart. This is, <laughs> this is your role. This is refuge. And if that's truly the view you take, if you truly approach with the Four Noble Truths, seeing dukkha as a chance to understand craving and let go of it, to realize peace at a deeper level, then when things are not as you wish they would be, that's when the most potent times for practice are. And the Dhamma and the world will only, it might be a bit too much to say this, but one can look at the difficulty in one's life as a crucible applied with enough heat applied in measure with the instrument that you are meant to be forged into. And granted, the language of purpose and uh, teleology and destiny might be a bit much for a Buddhist conception, but the Four Noble Truths are a self-fulfilling prophecy. If you really approach the world and its brokenness with the Four Noble Truths in mind, then I've never seen a limit to how far you can use difficulty to let go of craving and to become selfless and pure. So that's the goal. Can you understand when the world is giving you a crucible? And to understand that the Buddha said patient endurance is the supreme incinerator of defilement. It's the cleansing flame. And that sometimes when things are hard, when anger or fear rises up, that as a practitioner you know your whole purpose is to remain still and calm and caring in the midst of that and let that heat kind of work on you until it cools down, until you make it to the other side of the first and second noble truth of stress and craving and find there's a hidden peace and coolness and majesty at the other end. That is grace and that is the third and fourth noble truth. So hold still and be kind and calm. And to see that the idea of anger in a Buddhist conception never has a place. There was a BBC program, I've talked about this before, where different religious leaders were asked, um, is there ever a purpose or a place for anger? And the Dalai Lama was the only one who said, no, there's never a place for anger. And this is the Buddha standard. The Buddha in the simile of the saw, which many of you know, said, even if bandits were to dismember you limb from limb with a two-handled saw, that those among you who gave rise to even one thought of ill will would not be doing my bidding. That's the standard, and that's quite a standard. But to know that, you know, there are wholesome elements frequently woven into that sense of, reaction or outrage or whatever it might be, say a sense of deep values, of energy, of things needing to be done, but those can always be separated from the anger. The anger never has a place for expression, ever. An action is always more powerful when it comes from love. And even more so when the world around you is filled with division. So to know that this is the standard going in when that goldsmith cleans the gold of its coarse defilements, gravel, sand, grit, and the mind of, uh, or rather conduct of, misconduct of body, speech, and mind. You know, to know that when you speak going into these next years or months, you'll notice more and more if you are practicing when you emerge from a conversation just feeling sticky, like that, that was not necessary. I fed something in that other person which did not need to be fed. 
And what would it mean to be kind and calm and curious and loving and hold a deeper refuge? People talk about the world in heated terms enough. They do not need another voice like that in their life. What they need is someone who can hold a deeper space of care and calm and sanctuary. That is what you can give. And it is a duty. If you've come in contact with these teachings and value them and have taken refuge, this is how you represent them and carry them into the world. You've been given a gift. Do not squander it. That gold mixes with nothing. And if you'll notice, if there's ever anything, the brighter your heart becomes with Dhamma, the more pure that gold becomes. Any blemish on it becomes viscerally visible. You come out of the conversation and you know you didn't have to jump into that same conversation that's played out over the dinner table 50 times already. You know you could have actually represented something else that's cooler and calmer. Misconduct of speech. And then misconduct of, sp uh, of body, or uh, sorry, of mind. Um, just in Buddhist conception, we have no real influence over what past thoughts come into our mind, or very little. Um, you can't even predict what your mind's gonna throw at you in the next five seconds. You know, how is this you and yours? It's not even just tuning into a radio, it's your neighbor's radio. Um, but karma is created, misconduct of mind is created when you feed into those thoughts, when you buy into them, when you run with the fantasy, when you become drunk and colored by the thought, that is what you restrain. And with anger, it's so important to keep vigil over that. Ajahn Brahmali says mindfulness daily in daily life should have two functions, chiefly two functions for most of us, to keep your morality and to avoid dwelling in ill will. So as soon as the anger comes up, confront it. Don't go back into the argument or into the uh, self-justification. I know a practitioner who says, if he finds himself repeating any view three times really vehemently internally, he knows he's wrong, at least to some degree. There's something delusion, delusional in there. And some of you may have heard our interview with Ajahn Mudito several weeks ago. And he said, sensuality will pretend it's your friend. Uh, ill will, hatred, will pretend it's necessary. Ill will will pretend it's necessary. Delusion will pretend it doesn't exist. <laughs> it's brilliant. <laughs> but anger, it's not enough just to note it sometimes. Sometimes you're going to just have to turn more towards it, expand your view consciously, look at the good parts of the people you're angry at, or use the Four Noble Truths to trace back their own suffering. Can you understand where their suffering comes from, where their vulnerability is? And the Buddha said, Vedana, feeling is the meeting place, I think. Contact is origin, feeling is meeting place. Dukkha is where we meet. That's not exactly what the sutta is supposed to mean, but I like it for this, this, for this purpose. Dukkha is such an important place to come to in terms of understanding that root and shared humanity. So can you trace that back for others? And then to see the middle defilements of thoughts of ill will, thoughts of harmfulness, thoughts of sensuality. And I've just touched on these. But what would it mean right now to really take that seriously, to understand that your purpose during difficult times is to restrain the heart from falling into that and to not react, to not react. And people don't realize how powerful non-reaction is, it roars. In a space filled with reaction, there's something about a quiet humility which the majesty can echo out. Uh, I was at a Bayagiri last week and one of the monks was talking about when he was an Anagarika, a uh, white-robed aspirant, and he would um, make oatmeal and he had all these leftover donuts that he kept putting in the monk's oatmeal or no, no, sorry, the lay people's oatmeal. And one day they were surrounded by all the lay people in the kitchen and one other postulant turned to him and said, you didn't make the oatmeal disgustingly sweet like you did last time, right? 
And he said, no, no, I, you know, he was just so embarrassed. He said, no, I, I, this is it's just a normal oatmeal. And then he kind of quietly went over and sat in a corner, kind of just eating and just the pounding sense of self, self embarrassment. And then someone came over to him and said, that was, that was amazing. And he said, what? And he said, you know, just, you didn't react. You didn't react. I mean, he insulted you in front of everyone. He, that was so amazing. And we don't realize how powerful a quiet center point can be. So to understand that, and then the fine defilements, and this is where you see the Buddha's genius just glow through. Where he said, one cleanses the minds of the fine defilements of thoughts of one's homeland, thoughts of one's caste, one's color, social station, social orientation, social position, and thoughts of not wanting to be despised. Oh, just to back up to the ill will part, actually, there's another great sutta where the Buddha says one can have three kinds of mind. You can have a mind like stone, which is where, where letters etched into the stone are etched in quickly and remain for a long time, just like one who angers quickly and the anger remains. You can have a mind like sand, where letters may be sketched in, but then the wind and water quickly sweep them away, like one who angers quickly, but the anger quickly fades. Or you can have a mind like water, where letters, when written, immediately disappear. And even so, one, when spoken to harshly, does not get angry. And I think it says, remains on good terms with that person, something like that. And he says also, there's another three kinds of mind one can have. You can have a mind like a pustule, where if you poke it, it squirts out pus. And that's like one who's, when spoken to harshly, uh, excretes angry words in return. It's so good. You can, have a mind, you can have a mind like a flash of lightning, which is where you've seen the truth. You've seen the Dhamma. That's a sotapanna for a brief moment. You can have a mind like a diamond which is the enlightened, perfected mind. So which of those three are we gonna go for? <laughs> and every time, like when you feel yourself about to rise up and spray out, just think, oh man, I do not wanna be that pimple. <laughs> I went through that in high school, it was enough. But those final three course, uh, fine defilements, thoughts of one, one's homeland, just remembering America is a concept America is a concept. It's a, you know, as a human, especially with one of, with a belief in rebirth, we are part of a much bigger storyline now. Thoughts of one's caste, giving those up, one's color. And this is important: is that if you really are practicing and you represent Dhamma, huge caveat for this whole talk, you can continue to, you know do good work, you can continue to contribute socially to where you feel it's meaningful. Those are all on the table. Every time I give this talk, someone will come up and be like, you know, helping socially is good, I think. And I, yes, it is, it's good, but, but you can do it without anger. And you can also acknowledge that there's actually equation to, an equation to be run where if positioning yourself in terms of the caste systems of our, I'm not gonna throw that word around. The social positions which you find yourselves in and the different parties or views, if you turn off someone to the Dhamma because you jump into that narrative or that argument without fruit, without the right consideration, then that is blameworthy. You might be once someone's only route into the Dhamma and that might take a more gentle, caring approach, it might mean you put aside the political conversation. A monk once said to me, we get to be passionate about two things as monks, um, the five precepts and the Brahma Viharas. Obviously there's more, but if monks had a yard sign, that would be it. But really is, is, is what would it mean to approach those conversations with care and curiosity? What would that mean? And you can still have those discussions, you can still approach with 
you know, there's a place for that, but it would mean so much more to lead in with a, gen with a gentle touch and to make sure that it's worth jumping into those realms. And the final thing of thoughts of not wanting to be despised. I don't know exactly where that fits into this talk, but I love that one. It's so good. And just remembering that. And to know that um, I was actually, for this talk, I was curious how they did smelt gold. And one of the ways they do it is they, I think they mix it a bit with lead. And somehow the lead grabs all the heavier elements and leaves kind of a bead of gold, something like that. And similarly, when the heavier elements enter your life, when the tragedy, when the difficulty, when the fear, when the anger come, that, strangely enough, can be the impetus for you to really separate out that gold. Someone was saying at the table this morning that they you know, were upset by events in the world right now and what had really given their heart comfort was thinking, you know, the people that I'm surrounded by here, the Dhamma, it remains and it is pure and untouched. And that is true. Those with little dust in their eyes are always few in the world. But this thread of Dhamma has lasted through so much so much up and down in the world, so much breaking. And our duty to carry it on gently with love is, it's such a gift and it is refuge. There's that wonderful teacher who said, um, I think it was, was it Gurdjieff? Yeah, maybe. He said, uh, if, you know, I, w I dreamt that life was a joy I awoke and found that life was a duty. I acted and behold, duty was a joy. So, you know, whether you're glad of kind of the place the world is right now or have difficulty with it, wherever you land, odds are your, our, all of our vision is a little bit too tunneled. And to expand to into a, a wider scope of dharma, of humanity, of heart, and to take heart that, you know, the world has lasted and the Dhamma has lasted through so many ups and downs and that we have refuge in this. Um, and that it's our duty to really hold that and carry it on for those around us. So I wish you all the best in the coming weeks and months and lifetimes. Hum damayang damakataya sadhu karang dhanamasei Sadhu, 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 anumodami. And I want to acknowledge, um, you know, it's true that Dharma crowds in Seattle tend to lean a bit left. And so, you know, obviously the talk had a bit of the valence of speaking about those who have been upset by recent events. But really, really, um, Ajahn Kovil and I want to maintain a space where it's genuinely just um, a very open, caring space where we can come together as Buddhists, as Dharma practitioners. That's what we're here for. So the triple gem and the disco ball are welcome to, very much welcome to all. Um, so we have time for questions now. If people want to raise their hands, they may, and we'll run a mic over to you. And then those on the... Uh, Computer may also raise their hand. Uh, Mom. And Joseph, we may move some, open up some space to some others uh, who speak, spoke, speak a bit, who've spoken a bit less in recent weeks, if that's okay. Mom. That, yeah. uh, um, thank you for that talk. It was wonderful, um, important. So I never hear this. I'd be really curious, and you might have mentioned, you might have talked about it when you talked about the heavier elements separating out, but you know, some people have said, I'm not mad, I'm heartbroken. But that still seems to s drain something beautiful away in a way, you know, like, should you, sometimes, to me, that can be a murky thing, grief, of where uh, othering can be mixed in there. So I was wondering if you would talk about that with, you know, I don't hear grief talked about that much in the Dhamma, mm -hmm. interestingly. And um, so that, you know, a number of people have said, no, I'm not angry, I'm heartbroken, and I get it, and it seems 
there's something I'd love clarification about with it. Question, do you want to answer that? I'll come after. Yeah, it is good. I mean, it's nice that people are looking deeply at their own minds and hearts and, and bodies and seeing how they're reacting to these things and getting some nuance about how one's feeling about this. And I do think having some kind of Buddhist vocabulary into this can be helpful, like a heartbroken can be really positive. I mean, it can be pointing to the aspect of looking at the dukkha within, acknowledging the aspect of unsatisfactoriness, the as aspect of yeah, just um, yeah, some kind of emotional sadness. But then there's also uh, this other word in Pali, domanasa, which could literally be translated as heartbroken. Mana, like the mind or the heart. Do is like a, a bad or broken. And it's, it is in Abhidhamma, so kind of Buddhist philosophy, it's always an unwholesome mind state. So it's the type of heartbrokenness that is uh, dejected and is looking at the world not accurately, but um, through a lens that's dark and is not in a position to look upwards and, and see solutions, but is just blinded by uh, too much of a degree of, of darkness. Um, so yeah, parsing out in one's own heart, in one's own mind, in one's own brain, okay, what is this intelligent recognition of internal unsatisfactoriness of pain? Which aspect of this is unhelpful grief or deje dejection, this dominasa, and what aspect is this compassion, which is also to be cultivated. Um, so if it is a heartbrokenness that sees the pain of others, but isn't paralyzed by that, but which can, can see a clear path forward, and the danger of the heartbrokenness that is this dominasa, this brokenness, emphasize, emphasis on the brokenness versus the heartness, then you can't you can't see clearly. There's not, you're, you're in the dark seeing blindly, so. No, I think that was wonderful. And I would say just there is a place for part of, I think, touching into that universal truth of dukkha um, is expanding the view to take, you know, this not as this is a broken situation, but expanding it to like this is samsara's brokenness, which we all touch. And... Um, and also to complicate, because you do, the tunnel visioning does come with craving and othering, and I think you begin to get a sense for that. And it's helpful to kind of complicate those perceptions. Like, if, if the headlines were accurate of the newspapers over the last 25 years, every day the front page headline would be another 20,000 people lifted out of extreme poverty. You know, that's an important, like, if you're thinking the world's completely going downhill, I mean, really, like, expand the view a little bit um, and just soften those perceptions. And for me, that lets the tunnel vision soften a bit into a wider, more wholesome and dharmic perspective as well. Thank you. It's a tough time for everybody, I think, and it's a tough time to give a Dhamma talk. Um, and I wanted to say just what's been helping me is self-compassion, self-compassion. Um, and I came to this through Pema Chodron's book, When Things Fall Apart. And to me, that's so appropriate right now for how I've been feeling. So I just wanted to offer that, that the self-compassion then, you can then offer that to everyone else. It enables the compassion to come out, whereas the resistance and the fear and the, you know, oh, I'm just going to be quiet and not say anything because I'm a good Buddhist. You know, that, that isn't the reality for me. But if I have self-compassion and compassion for others, then what comes out is, you know, we're here in samsara together. So I just wanted to offer that. And thank you for your talk. And sometimes it can be weird to praise someone to their face in public, but uh, looking at you, you look very self-compassioned, and it does it does uh, spread. So uh, yeah, thank you for.
Um, so this has kind of been answered by you, honestly, but I'm kind of opening up this question to really any advice from anybody in this room, because it's something I've been struggling with since before the election and all of that stuff. Um, I have a good couple of friends who have very opposing political views from my own, um, and I don't have any problems really talking to them about it. I, I'm very good at like not turning those into arguments, um, but particularly after the election, I find myself losing, losing a lot of compassion, particularly for this one friend who is just, <sighs> I love her very much, um, but in my opinion, she's quite ignorant to a lot of these things. And it's just, it's hard to hold that in a place of compassion when she is like saying all of these things about, a com all of she's like complimenting a community and showing love for a community that she's very actively not supporting um, and very actively fighting against in everything other than her own words. Um, and I'm mainly just asking, like, how do I, what's the best way to still hold compassion for somebody that you do care about, but you're just incredibly angry at? <laughs> like, it's, um, I find myself going there rather than to self, or to compassion, um, a lot of the time, particularly when we talk about politics, because I just, I, yeah, I just get really angry. How do, how is it? What's the best advice to hold that compassion and keep it in those conversations? Um, we've actually this may have to be our last question because we have some extra stuff uh, today. That's a great one, though, Axel. And um, you know, I'd say that once again, it's the crucible of like those relationships that are fraught in that way, it's such an amazing realm of practice because you're really forced to work with that disjunct and to you know, not only really constrain your conversation to what's really meaningful about your relationship, which I'm guessing was never talking politics. You know, maybe that was part of it, but if that means that for this time you just steer away from those conversations or if it comes up on their end, you just say, you know, actually, I, I really value you as a friend. My heart really goes out, and this is kind of a troubled d domain for me right now. Can we just be with each other? You know, and, and I think that's actually a really powerful space to build a friendship. And also, you know, once again, that relationship, if you approach it with the goal of it being a realm of building love and breadth of heart and patience, like, you'll have plenty of opportunities to do just that. So that that's your teacher for the next while, perhaps, you know? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, no, the, dharm, the Dharma will throw at you just about up to the brim of what you can take, but, but in this case, maybe not beyond it, so. And um, today we wanted to take a chance to really uh, rejoice and celebrate the people and many of the people who make all this possible. Um, and we want to begin, actually, by calling up our board. Um, so who of our board is here? We got Kim, Dave, Steve, and Allison Thomas, who was our treasurer for many years. By many, I mean three. Come up here, Allison. She's also, um, when I initially said, thought I'd be coming to Seattle to live here, uh, these two people reached out and offered to Dave and Allison host me in their backyard for two weeks. And three and a half years later, we're still there. So Allison and Dave have uh, been responsible for, for Clear Mountain 1.0. Um, Allison was our treasurer for two and a half years, or three years actually, three whole years, sorry. And, <laughs> and really set up our um, organization on a, a foundation which actually could last. Um, she's just been instrumental and given so much time and care to this and recently had to step back a little bit for a variety of reasons. She's helping in so many different um, realms and we really wanted to take this chance to to celebrate um, all the good she did 
So I was going to pass the mic over to uh, the board and then to Ajin, or Ajin Kovilo and then the board, one or the other. And then eventually we'll have Allison say something, perhaps. Yeah, so um, when I was thinking about Allison, um, a few qualities came up that I thought I might highlight. Um, the first sort of, Allison has this just sweetness of spirit, which I'm sure you've all experienced, and this humility, um, which I think is so rare in somebody who is also so steadily competent. Um, and, you know, Allison has really poured all of those qualities into helping us create a foundation, a structure for this organization that we really desperately um, needed and is going to serve so many for so long. Um, and yeah, she's just a gem. Um, yeah, thank you so much. Not much to add to that, really, Allison, but I have to say, when I think about um, my own practice and how much benefit I have received from being in this community and the work that you have done to lay the foundation for this community. And uh, it's been such a gift to so many and to me. So thank you. And I've just appreciated many things about getting to know you your amazing kindness and just just pure loving gentleness about you. And then in some miraculous way, we're just sort of figuring things out and you come up with these numbers like, Junk! here's the finances, like, oh my God, that is so organized. That was just amazing. And then lastly, you know, as, as Ajahn Nisabo was suggesting, I mean, actually you live in a fairly small yard with three male persons and yourself and you've had incredible balance and kindness about that and incredibly generous to, to, to welcome that to Kutis and a husband, to, m to monastics in Kutis and a husband. So how wonderful. Thank you. Thank you. And I'm going to miss having you on the board, but I know you're still here. Just a quick note. Um, people may have noticed we are Clear Mountain Monastery, but we don't actually have monastery as land, but we do have monastery as community. And really a monastic community, a monastery community, even more than being the land, is the community. And the community is a interrelationship between the monastics and all the lay people. And you all are the lay donuts in our monastic oatmeal. <laughs> in the best way, in the best way. Because that sounded really delicious, actually. <laughs> yeah, not that I want to eat that every day, but um, yeah. And the board and all of our volunteers, you are like the sprinkles on the donuts in our oatmeal. Yeah. And Allison, you are like a particularly refined gold sprinkle who also organizes the other sprinkles in spreadsheets <laughs> and straight lines. So thank you so much. So now that we've thoroughly embarrassed Allison, uh, Allison, would you like to say anything about your time as treasurer? <laughs> um, yeah, it's um, mm, it's been a real gift to um, have this community. Um, yeah, I didn't have, I wasn't looking for anything, <laughs> and it just sort of landed in my backyard, <laughs> and. Um, and I think, yeah, I've sort of spoken about this um, in my community stories a few years ago, but I, yeah, it's just been a blessing to have um, the Dhamma drop in my backyard <laughs> and then to be able to support um, these wonderful monastics and to work with these beautiful practitioners and then to see that goodness just ripple out and everyone has a spot here in this community. I really believe that. And um, 
and though I've sort of stepped officially back from the board in treasure, I'm still here. <laughs> I still um, will be here carrying books up and down if I can until the body fails. <laughs> and um, I just encourage if you have any um, inkling of just like, oh, I'd like to help to reach out and just ask how you might. It is so beneficial. And also just, um, yeah, just the gratitude for everyone that has um, keeps coming here and supporting the community and these wonderful monastics that we're so blessed to have. So I thank you all. Get three big sadhus for Allison. Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu. So many spreadsheets. You all have no idea. <laughs> Kim, I think we have a gift. So we chose a tonka for you, um, just as a token of appreciation for um, to honor all of your your effort and dedication to the project. Okay, Clear Mountain Spirit Fingers, people, come on, sprinkles. <laughs> okay. Okay, so we're going to now make Allison not be up here alone with the board either. So if we can have our Sangha coordinators come up, we're going to uh, hand over the MC to them. Um, and board, no, you stay up here. Kim, you get back up here. <laughs> Good. Okay, hi. Uh, my name is Christina. I am one of three Sangha coordinators. I'm joined by Bonnie and Jeremy, and we wanted to acknowledge our volunteer base today. Uh, this community has been steadily growing over three years. We're to the point where our Saturday group is like 85 on average, and uh, we literally touch people around the world. We've hit a milestone on our Discord community. We're now a thousand strong on there, so we're growing steadily. And none of that growth would be possible without the backbone of our volunteer base, who does so much in giving their skill, their energy, and their time to make sure that everything works flawlessly and also supports the monastics in their practice and alleviates them of the burden of having to do some of the facilitation of everything. So um, each of us over the past three months have been getting to know our respective groups of volunteer uh, uh, groups and we just wanted to acknowledge them individually one at a time. So since I have the mic, I'll start. Um, I'm in charge of the remote volunteer group. So these are the people that maintain our email, the Discord, the Mission Majima project, whether they're facilitating or editing the videos and the audio that's part of that project. The gratitude stewards who call anytime somebody makes a donation, our publicity stewards who manage our social media and our PR efforts. If you are on Zoom and part of this group, please raise your electronic hand so we can publicly thank you. And if you're in person and part of any of those groups, please stand so we can acknowledge you today. And should we give sadhus one at a time? Three sparkly sadhus, please, for our remote volunteer group. Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu. Hi, I'm in charge of these wonderful Seattleite volunteers. Um, I chose this, or kind of been given this, <laughs> this great gift, really, because it's been wonderful to come every week and do the events and do this daily stuff and just see the energy and the love and the time. I thought a long time about this this week in lieu of everything. And the gift of time is so precious. I mean, we could write checks and that's important too, but to give your time, I think is the greatest gift that you can. And you do it so willingly and with smiles and it's just wonderful to see, and I'm very honored to be 
part of this and to work with you. I am in charge, if you want to use that word, um, of the AV group and the setup group, the Saturday setup group, photography, um, the malas, the librarian, and just everybody and everything that makes this work so beautifully. It's just a privilege to be here. Thank you. Oh, stand, and everybody, anybody who's ever done anything in the realm of volunteering, stand up. And three sadhus. Sadhu. 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 Yeah, volunteering makes you happy, so I encourage it. Uh, yeah, I've had the pleasure of working with the board who we've, uh, who we've got up here in the front, as well as uh, Brianna and the Land Search Committee, and Katie, if she's here, uh, and her finance team as well, all play a really important part. So yeah, if Brianna, you'd like to stand up and we can all say sadhu, and Katie, if you're here, and, and the board as well. Brianna, we need to embarrass you a little. <laughs> Good. Sadu, sadu, sadu. Have them come up to speak. Yeah. Yeah. We don't have sparkly donuts, <laughs> but we have sparkly cupcakes. So please, everybody, help yourself afterwards, and they're coming up. And then I think we do want to invite four or five volunteers if you're feeling so inclined to just speak to what it's meant to you to give the gift of your time. Not while you're eating the donuts, but you can be <laughs> receiving one. But yeah, if we could um, just, it, first, if you have to go, I know it's 11, you can, but um, we won't judge you. But uh, if we could have, yeah, a few volunteers just. You take a cupcake on your way out. <laughs> <laughs> We're not actually sure where to give the cupcakes. <laughs> <laughs> okay, maybe we can, as a group, pretend to blow them all out so that they don't set the fire alarms off by continuing to burn too long. Okay, one, but don't actually spit on the cupcakes. So yeah, that's one, two, three, sparkly fingers at the cupcakes. All right, good work. And Bonnie made those. Um, so. It, it, sadhu. It, the three Sangha coordinators really did step up and uh, have really been helping us facilitate this whole team. But if we could have open just a little bit of space for anyone who's served as a volunteer just to say what the experience has meant for them. Um. I think over the last three and a half years or so, the generosity, and including this week that I've witnessed, um, has been amazing. And as a volunteer, um, to do something for the community that I already love doing, <laughs> and um, to be able to offer that has just been my great joy. And I, this is, this is home. And um, yeah, I, I think what I said earlier, you know, just to, just taking refuge in the triple gem and the continued reminder. And I see it every week here, I see it down at the market for Bindabat um, so often. And so it's, it's just my great privilege and honor to be here. Thank you.
Somebody knows how to do this. <laughs> and I don't know how to say what I'm trying to say, but um, I came here to learn how to do meditation from professionals, from the people who know how. And I immediately was taught that this is about, my whole life is about my practice, not just the cushion. And every time I deal with people here, with all of you, I find you reminding me of that because I forget. And it's not just the Swiss cheese that is my memory that makes me forget your names. It's that I get immersed in the world and I forget. I forget the Dhamma and you remind me of it. And so you make me aware that this is always here and I can always turn to it if I just remember. And you're the ones who remind me. That's what it's meant to be here and to be so engaged with you in helping set up and all of this. So that's what I thank you for. Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu. Okay, one more. John, on Zoom. Hi, John. Everyone's saying hello. <laughs> Can't hear you yet. Can we unmute him? Go for it again, John. I think you're muted, John. Still muted. It might be on your end, John. Can you unmute? How are you at charades? <laughs> <laughs> Okay, <laughs> all right. <laughs> well, John, it's very good to see your face anyways. Feel free to type into the chat what you'd like to say. Try again, John, one more time. Oh, there you go. Go for oh, it, John. There we, are. we can hear okay. you. <laughs> yeah, so I volunteered for a little while at Clear Mountain uh, a couple years ago, and uh, I just found it to be really wonderful to serve this community and kind of get my mind and my heart off of uh, the self-centered kind of focus, you know, off of myself. And uh, that just really saved me. Like that really, that really helped because uh, I was going through some rough times and uh, nothing to get you out of a rut, like coming to Clear Mountain and helping with set up and tear down and uh, you know, meeting all kinds of great people. And so I'm just so grateful. And thank you all. <laughs> been a tremendous help in my life. Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu. And Joseph providing the hearts as always. Sadhu <laughs> Joseph. We, uh, we found out we were having to grind like a huge bag of coffee for the robe offering ceremony. We found out John was grinding it all by hand. And, uh, he was pretty buff afterwards, I think, at least on one side. Um, so good. All right. So if we can do one more uh, sparkly clear mountain spirit fingers. Okay. And maybe, um, actually, can we have the Sangha coordinators, two of them keep holding the banner so we have it up. And if we can bring the cupcakes up here. And as we wrap up, if volunteers can come up and get a cupcake, if you don't want it, you can give it away. But... Um, they might be standing here until you actually come up and get a cupcake. But I think that lets, at least for a little bit, just to honor that beautiful banner that Bonnie got and the beautiful cupcakes and the volunteers. Um, so let's just do three big, wonderful sadhus one last time. Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu. We don't really have any other words to celebrate with. It's the thing. And uh, now we'll all bow to the Buddha if you want. No pressure. Unless you're holding cupcakes. <laughs>